All right, thank you everyone um, for being part of our uh, last session for the day. This is the Q&A. Um, thank you to um, all the panelists that are here today and to all those that uh, could not make it for really great lectures. This was really a fantastic day. So thank you to all of you. So today um, with us, we have Dr. David Richards from um, MD Anderson Cancer Center, Dr. Jennifer Chan from uh, Dana-Farber, uh, Dr. Oz um, Ahmed from the University of Chicago, Dr. Uh, Lon Heath from UCSF, and then our own uh, Dr. Setia and Dr. Liao, uh, also from the University of Chicago. So um, we've gotten a lot of questions uh, through Slido. As a matter of fact, we gotten, uh, we've gotten over 60 questions, and we're going to spend a little bit of time here the next 30 minutes or so. Uh, going through some of these questions that you've asked. So uh, thanks again for being uh, part of our panel and uh, thanks to all our patients who have followed um, the NetRF conference throughout the day today. So let's start uh, with the first question. Um, I've put them in four uh, categories, nuclear medicine, IR surgery, I've grouped that together, uh, octreotide and sort of more general questions. So uh, there's a a uh, patient here that says that uh, his or her serotonin levels are remaining high in the 600s, even though her primary tumor and the uh, liver metastasis have been removed. And the question to the panel is if this is um, unusual. So um, I think I'll, I'm going to uh, call out to uh, uh, Jennifer Chan here and then to Dave uh, Richards as well to see if there are any nutritional things that can cause high serotonin levels. So why don't we start with uh, Jen? What do you think? Do you do you see this uh, in patients where the serotonin level remains high, or how reliable is serotonin as a marker? That's another question, I guess, in this case. Yeah, I think we have to be careful with the markers. Um, some of the markers haven't really been so well validated for follow-up after resection. I typically don't follow markers like serotonin or chromogranin routinely after surgery. Um, they can, for instance, be elevated for other reasons, whether it be medication or diet. So I would really just uh, make sure there's good imaging follow-up and good attention to symptoms rather than relying on blood tests themselves. Perfect. Thank you. Dr. Richards, anything to add to that? Well, I, I think, you know, with symptomatic patients, there's, uh, there's been some buzz about avoiding high amine containing foods and how these may, you know, contribute to uh, tumor product production um, and uh, contribute to symptoms. Um, so, but I, I would have to defer to Dr. Chan or, or some of the other experts here to say whether or not you'd see increased like serum levels of these things if you were on a particularly high amine you know food diet i don't i don't know how much that's really going to fuel things and then wind up like kicking up your your tumor markers but there there has been buzz of you know nutritionally about vo avoiding high amine foods um, in patients who are pretty symptomatic with carcinoma syndrome yeah i think you bring up a very good point i think that we all would agree that um uh, metastatic nets, even after surgery, are rarely cured, right? So there's some disease left behind somewhere. And even though, like Dr. Chan suggested, uh, you know, if we have really good uh, scans, for example, like a PET scan, you know, it could certainly, uh, it doesn't necessarily rule out that there's microscopic disease somewhere. And you have to think of these cells like little factories, right? They keep producing some of these hormones. And sometimes, I guess, even uh, nutrition or stress or like medication can essentially affect the production um, of the hormones. So I think it's a really good point that you bring up to maybe try a low amine diet and see if that actually makes a difference. Um, I don't know, uh, Jen or like Andy, if you have any experience with this, but uh, certainly something to try. Um, okay, so let's move on to uh, the next question. So this is going to be a question for uh, Courtney. So. Um, can you please discuss your experience with the relatively new copper scan for nets and how helpful is it if you compare it to the gallium uh, scan for nets? Absolutely. And um, so I, th I think what's being referred to here is the copper 64 Dota tape PET scan, as opposed to what kind of the FDA, the previously FDA approved agent that came before that was gallium 68 Dota tape PET scan. Um, so the key thing to keep in mind is that the compound itself, the only thing that's changed between the two compounds is the radioactive atom 
uh, that, that lets us take the picture of it with a PET scan. So the compound itself, dotatate, is exactly the same. And, and so it's a, actually a pretty small difference. Now, the um, copper 64 came about, uh, you know, after gallium 68 on the basis of, there were a couple of papers that showed, you know, that it was similar to maybe slightly increased in our ability to find um, lesions. Now, um, I gotta be honest, when we first switched over at, at our facility at UCSF and started using this, there were some growing pains because it, it, it images a little bit differently. And this is all just stuff on the back end that wouldn't really affect, um, it wouldn't really affect a patient downstream, but we found, we thought that they were pretty sort of, um, difficult to look at scans compared to gallium 68. It actually required us to make the PET scans a little bit longer in order to get enough um, signal. Uh, but that's all sort of shop talk. And honestly, um, there's been a lot of talk back and forth. Is this better? Is it worse? Is it, you know, whatever. I think our, ultimately our experience, we do a ton of these um, now. We've switched over completely to gallium 64. Um, and in, in our experience, it's not better. It's not worse. It's just, it's just a little different. And ultimately, um, I think either one, you know, if, if your insurance, you know, often these days people are getting one or the other because their insurance covers one or the other. And ultimately that it's really not a deal breaker either way. Um, so I wouldn't worry either way. The one thing I would say is you, the, the one sort of caution I would say is you can't compare SUVs or anything between a copper and a gallium. So whichever one you end up getting, it's best to get the same one every time. If you're all, if you get a copper scan, you don't want to get a copper scan and then a gallium and then a copper and a gallium. That's harder to compare. Uh, so keeping it all copper, 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 or gallium, gallium, gallium. Perfect. Thank you so much. So the next question would be a question uh, that I think uh, we all could answer, but I also would like to hear Dr. Setia's point on that. Uh, how do you determine which tumor is the primary tumor? And I think that refers to uh, patients that perhaps present uh, with a dotatape scan or some other form of scan that showed multiple uh, sites of disease uh, without any convincing um, evidence that there is actually a large primary tumor somewhere. So how would we address this, let's say, from a pathological perspective? Um, we'll certainly come back to some of the imaging clues that we could certainly have to, to determine where the primary tumor is. But let's say we take a biopsy of the liver and we know that these tumors don't uh, traditionally originate in the liver. Dr. Setia, is there something from that biopsy specimen that you could do to help us determine where these tumors came from? Yes, um, thank you, Dr. Kugin. This, that's a very good question. And I think it's very important, uh, not just for the patients, but for also for us, because several times we are able to answer that and we feel great about it, but then other times we are not able to answer it and then we feel very bad about ourselves. <laughs> So as I mentioned that we are able to answer it several times and that's using certain markers uh, which are expressed by the, the neuroendocrine tumor cells and they need certain transcription factors for them to grow and based on what transcription factors they are using to grow, uh, which we can see under the microscope by staining them differentially, we are able to tell. For example, if the tumor is very strongly staining for say CDX2, that's one of the markers, which we can, which is easily available in most labs, we are able to say it's coming from small intestine. But then there are other times when they are not expressing CDX2 and they are not expressing some other transcription factors which are very strongly indicated. Then we, are, we, we really rely on imaging to see where the bulk of the tumor is located and to determine what the primary site is. So I would say that in about 80% cases, we are able to tell what the primary site is. But in the other um, instances, uh, we use Imaging is one uh, modality that we would use. The other is molecular techniques. And sometimes when we do molecular, we are able to find certain mutations or certain copy number changes that we are able to say, well, it could be coming from pancreas. So we try to use as many ancillary techniques as are available to us. Again, sometimes we are unsuccessful. Thank you. And I would add that from a radiologic perspective, we have two radiologists here, one nuclear medicine, one IR perspective. But I think even as a surgeon, if you look very carefully at the scans, you can often uh, see uh, 
or try to figure out what the primary is. So uh, small bowel neuro endocrine tumors, for example, are notorious for being very small and very hard to detect on um, any form of a scan. But if you look carefully, um, usually if you see lymphadenopathy, so um, enlarged lymph loads around the mesenteric vessels, so the vessels that supply the small bowel, it will be very unusual to be another site of disease except for the small bowel. You can have retroperitoneal nodes uh, that can certainly come from the pancreas or the lung. Um, but usually if there is a disease within the small bowel mesentery, it's almost certain that it's easy, either going to be a colonic or a small bowel neuroendocrine tumor. So there are certain hints on the radiology report where we could certainly get some information from, um, I would say. Dr. Chen, does it matter whether you know where the primary tumor is? I mean, if you have metastatic disease, I guess that's a million dollar question. Should we ask Dr. Setia to do a thousand stainings and really work hard? And then she feels bad because she can't tell us, you know, where it's coming from. I mean, does it really matter in your management? Or is it okay to just say a tumor is unknown primary? I do think it is um, helpful to know where it started. And I think we also will ask our pathologists to give their, their best guess of where it started because it, it can help prognostically. Um, there are some differences stage for stage, grade for grade between small bowel neuroendocrine tumors and pancreas and lung neuroendocrine tumors. And I think also importantly, there are some differences in responsiveness to therapy, most notably, for instance, lung and pancreas neuroendocrine tumors being more chemotherapy responsive. So that's why I think why we try as best we can to determine primary site. That's why we still need Dr. Setia. <laughs> Thank you so much. All right, good. Next question is going to be for uh, Dr. Ahmed, who's uh, ready to answer it, I hope. So um, there's a patient that said that at the NET conference last November, a targeted treatment was reported to be in clinical trial using ultrasound beams. What have been the findings so far? Can you summarize that? Yeah, absolutely. And I'm ready for your question as always, um, Xavier. Um, so I think the question is referring to a new technology known as histotripsy, which is um, basically using ultrasound waves um, have a, uh, used, used to be sort of a side effect of ultrasound is that it could create cavitation, but they've sort of harnessed that energy and focus those beams to actually blast tumors away. Um, it's really attractive because it's non-invasive and it's also non-thermal, meaning it doesn't um, require heat. It doesn't uh, heat up the tissues, which um, could potentially have negative consequences to um, close critical structures. So that um, first, um, the first study that was completed uh, was actually done in Europe that went um, uh, very well. They showed good results. They were really mainly looking for safety to make sure that this is to be safely used in humans and also um, get good responses. Um, and then the, uh, the first study in the United States, as mentioned, sort of started last year. It is actually still ongoing. Um, they did uh, sort of um, just uh, complete enrollment uh, the tar for, for submitting the information to the FDA or the government to get approval here in the United States. So um, I don't unfortunately have um, any conclusive data yet because we're waiting um, for the um, study results to accumulate. But uh, we're really optimistic that this technology will be approved um, within the year or two. Great. Thank you. Dr. Liao, I know we can't see you, but um, hopefully we can hear you. One of the questions regarding octreotide since you gave that lecture was, other than the administration process, is there any real difference between lanreotide and long-acting octreotide or sandostatin? <clears throat> there definitely are differences in terms of um, you know, biodistribution and pharmacokinetics. In, in other words, you know, after the drug is administered, how it hangs out in your body, how it's eliminated. Other than the administration, um, you know, one is uh, subcutaneous and one is intramuscular. Efficacy-wise, you wouldn't say, you know, definitively that one is better than another in terms of um, tumor control or in terms of um, symptom control. Great. Thank you. Back to Dr. Lon Heath. So there's a patient here that uh, said that she or he had a good effect after four cycles of PRT. So the question is, why can't you follow up at lower doses, quote unquote, uh, using a maintenance therapy? Yeah, that's a, that's a very interesting question. It's something that people um, have looked at and are looking at um, in some locations, uh, in particular in Canada, there are some centers that are doing maintenance uh, doses of PRRT. Um, generally, the, I think the reason that that's not being looked at much here um, and by most centers is it's generally thought that, you know, it, 
it has its therapeutic effect. And then why would you give these constant sort of sub therapeutic, you know, these small doses that are less likely there, there are some concerns that if you keep giving really small doses um, of PRRT, that you're actually sort of encouraging, you're not giving enough to actually kill the tumor cells and you're sort of encouraging them to become resistant um, to PRRT. Now, again, that's something that's been sort of shown like in vitro in other tumors, it's very unclear if this act, if how much this really applies to PRRT in net, which is why there are people, um, particularly in Canada that are, that are looking at this. Um, but I think for now, what we're, what we generally think is like, let's go ahead and hit those tumors hard a few times with a dose we know is going to be therapeutic. Uh, and, and then, uh, when the time comes later down the road, um, if necessary, if there was a good response after those first four cycles, then maybe in a, in a few years when progression happens again and the time is right, we could actually just retreat with a whole nother course of PRRT instead of just hitting it with all these sub-therapeutic doses, if that makes sense. It does to me. <laughs> so um, another question for Dr. Chen and maybe Dr. Richards, I don't know, but um, I have carcinoid syndrome. What should my dentist know regarding um, anesthesia? Is there anything in particular, Dr. Chan, that the dentist should know about? We all go to the dentist, or I hope so. Yeah, it's always helpful, I think, when my patients ask this to understand what sort of procedures are, are being planned. I think if it's just a routine dental cleaning, that's not going to involve any anesthesia. It's you know, something we don't necessarily have to worry about. I think if there's any anesthesia involved, it's helpful to know what kind of anesthesia is planned. Um, you know, I think we have historically tried to avoid like catecholamine type anesthesia, like epinephrine, because of the potential that it might worsen carcinoid syndrome or, or potentially provoke a crisis. I think the likelihood of that happening is quite honestly, relatively low, especially because of the kind of local anesthesia that most dentists give. Um, but I would also just, you know, when we try to time these procedures, make sure that the octreotide or lanreotide has been given so that the syndrome control is as best as possible. There was a follow-up question for Dr. Richards. There was a question where one of the patients asked whether um, altogether they should avoid um, alcohol um, if you're a net patient, what would you say to those patients? So there are definitely like a list of trigger foods um, that will precipitate symptoms. So typical ones that you read in the literature, things like tomato dishes, chocolate, nuts, raw veggies, pineapple, milk, bananas, but alcohol um, has been implicated as well, in particular uh, in regards to flushing. Um, so I probably like a lot of, um, uh, conditions, this is, this is probably one of those personal experience things, but I think if a patient's having flushing or if they're noticing symptom increase or symptom burden after drinking alcohol, it might be time to cut it out. Um, I would say in general, there's a lot of buzz right now in the oncology world about any alcohol, um, maybe not being a good idea in terms of your cancer risk. You know, it's a little bit debatable as you get older and issues with cardiac and all that kind of stuff. But, but for oncologists, it seems like everybody's encouraging no alcohol. And then as a gastroenterologist, I spend a lot of my day encouraging people to at least moderate alcohol. So, but specifically for NETs, maybe contributing to some flushing symptoms. Would it matter? Are you aware of any uh, type that is worse or is red wine worse than white wine or beer, for example, or it doesn't make a difference? I uh, haven't heard a difference. Um, I guess beer is a little bit of a, com a complex beverage. There's a lot of protein there and some other things. Um, I, you know, I guess if you're mixing drinks and you're mixing it with things that have caffeine and, and that sort of stuff, you may be adding other precipitants right. uh, of symptoms. So, so that might not be all that helpful. Um but, uh, but uh, probably a little bit of this trial and error. But if you're looking, if you're saying to yourself, hey, I'm still having symptoms and I'm wondering why, and alcohol might be a, on the top of the list of things to cut out to see if it helps reduce symptoms. Great, thank you. Dr. Ahmed, um, so this is a you versus me question. Um, how do you consider liver debulking versus interventional radiology? So that's the clash of the titans here. <laughs> Well, you know, like any good interventional radiologist, I just listen to whatever you say. So, yeah. <laughs> and I just uh, listen to whatever the oncologist says. Yeah. So, you know. <laughs> it's one big circle. Um, no, I mean, uh, it's actually a really good question. I think um, uh, 
I, I think it's a nuanced answer in the sense that, it, you know, um, we routinely have this discussion, you know, every tumor board, we, we look at the patient's imaging. And um, I do, you know, in all honesty, we do defer to your expertise in terms of the surgical ability to remove the tumors. Really, the short and dirty answer is if there's a lot of tumors that, that you know, you would have to spend hours and hours or potentially not even be able to take all of them out, um, then we tend to sort of favor the bland embolization um, approach. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think in general, we, we prefer if we can try to re surgically remove them and, but if it's not feasible, then we sort of prefer the interventional approach. Yeah, I completely agree. And I would even add that, uh, one is not exclusive or the other. The only time that I get a little bit, um, let's say, uh, discouraged to bring somebody to the operating room is somebody has had Y90, which, uh, sometimes can really cause fibrosis of the healthy liver. And that makes the operation a lot harder. Tumors tend to stick a lot. You know, we can not take out quite as much liver because we know we're beating up the liver a lot more. But, uh, but as you know, you and I have done it many times that patients had blood embo and then go for surgical debulking or have surgical debulking recur only in the liver and then have bland embo. I think that's, that's, that's very reasonable. And I think one is not exclusive for the other. So again, I think it depends um, also where you are at, uh, as a patient in like what center. Um, all right, so uh, let's keep on moving. We got a few more minutes here. So um, that's an interesting one. I was curious to see what Dr. Chan and uh, what Courtney have to say here. So being told PRT, not an option because the mesenteric mass is surrounding the artery. And so I'm assuming it's at the root of the mesentery or something like that. And they say PRT would cause swelling, including the artery. So here, and Dr. Liao, please chime in as well. We talk about, uh, probably what some people refer to as pseudo progression. So, um, is PRT really contraindicated in patients with mesenteric masses? So we routinely do PRT uh, in patients with mesenteric masses, although we don't do it in every single patient with a mesenteric mass. So it sort of depends on the size of the mass and it's sort of a number of other factors. Um, I will say uh, in general, so what we do with all these patients though is we uh, co we administer steroids along with, and we do a steroid taper um, in, in the cases of like bigger masses in order to make sure uh, that we minimize the chances of that mass swelling after getting PRRT. Dr. Chen, any comments on that? Do you give steroids to your patients as well? Yeah, I was going to say, we've taken a similar approach. I think we've had similar concerns that you might you know, provoke bowel obstruction for patients who have like a lot of peritoneal disease or a lot of mesenteric disease. Um, and I think a lot of the data are actually, it's mostly anecdotal um, about how helpful steroids may or may not be. But I think we've, we've tried to avoid some of the at least acute complications of the PRT in patients who have a lot of mesenteric or peritoneal disease. Dr. Liao, you want to chime in about sometimes even sending them to surgery prior to PRT? Is that something that yeah, we do? Yeah, I agree. You know, um, these bowel obstructions um, after PRT is something we definitely see from time to time, especially uh, with people with a lot of um, peritoneal mesenteric disease. And sometimes if we can have the disease, you know, surgically resected to make them more optimal candidates, something, sometimes that's what we do first before um, considering PRT, but definitely echoing um, Courtney and, and Jennifer, you know, we also consider steroids for these patients as well. Yeah, and I would add that from a surgical perspective, we can't uh, do miracles, but uh, occasionally, so if it's root of the mesentery lymphadenopathy, there's nothing we can do about it surgically. But I would argue that, you know, if there's, let's say, a five centimeter grade one or grade two lymphadenopathy that you know where some bowel feel like looks like it's stuck to it and you know it's going to cause some issue definitely it's it, it's a possibility to go in prior to given prt and uh and, and you know potentially resecting it but obviously you got to make sure the tumor is not rapidly progressing or anything like that because that would uh, just set the patients back by the time they recover um that's great so um that's an interesting question too. Are some atostatin um, analogs recommended for single liver metastases from a small intestine primary or would PRT be used? So here we can all chime in because I think this goes across all our specialties. So Oz would tell you he can ablate it probably if it's a single metastasis. <laughs> I would tell you I could take it out and or ablate it. Uh, Dr. Chan would probably tell you that uh, before, I don't know, what, what would you say before you put somebody on PRT, Dr. Chen, before I speak for you? 
Yeah, no, I would actually say that if it's a solitary lesion, I would favor doing something, whether it be surgery or um, ablation, because that I think hopefully we could, if that is controlled, you know, not even necessarily need to start any systemic therapy. I would just jump in here real quick as the nuke med um, person and, and just say, you know, PRT is one of those, those things that, you know, as we know, there is radiation associated with it. And as such, you can only get it, you know, so many times in your life. And so we want to save it for the time that it's going to be, you know, we only have, we have a lot of tools in our tool belt, but it's still, it's a finite number, right? So we want to save PRRT for the time we know it's going to have the most impact and, you know, just having a single met, uh, there are very few cases in which uh, I would say that's the right time for PRRT. Thank you, Courtney. Um, also an interesting one that I think affects probably about one out of five patients with metastatic disease. So but uh, Andy, what's the best way to treat metastasis in the bone? Um, and what's your opinion on uh, biphosphonates? So that's a good question. So, um, you know, we know neuroendocrine tumors can metastasize to the bones. And um, sometimes it can cause complications like pain or fractures and things like that. Um, in general, you know, when we have um, patients on some kind of systemic therapy, whether it be somatostatin analog or PRT, theoretically, you're treating the whole body, so including those bone metastases. Now, in, um, you know, other cancers, you know, with bone metastases, we frequently use things like um, like uh, solentronic acid, you know, bisphosphonate or, or things like the nosumab to prevent what's called uh, skeletal related adverse events, which are, you know, fractures and pain and, and these bad things that can happen with having cancer in the bone. And, you know, depending on the burden of disease in the bone, that is sometimes uh, something we consider for that patient as well. Thank you, Andy. Anything to add, uh, Jennifer? No, I, I agree. Um, I think we try to best control the disease with whatever systemic modality you choose, but then pay a special attention to reducing the risk of a, a skeletal event. I think the follow-up of patients with bone metastases can be very tricky. And I think that's where following with some form of PET imaging, whether it be copper 64 or gallium 68 is really, I think, quite critical. Um, so it may be that you don't need it all the time, but I think you have to um, pay attention. And I think sometimes you don't see everything well in the bone on, on CT. So that's where we can get bit fooled. I think that's a very good point. And then Oz, if you have a a single area that let's say you have multiple bone met, but one area where that, that's really hurtful, uh, where patients are truly symptomatic. Is there anything on on your end, either from a radiology or radon or IR perspective that you can do to help there? Yeah, absolutely. That's a great question. I was going to chime in too that you know there is a role usually for IR or, or radiation oncology for for bone mets, and uh, you you specifically highlighted for patients who have um, you know pain, and that's usually you know you can have pain. Uh, related to bone mets for two reasons. One is the tumor itself can cause pain. And then the second, as Andy mentioned, is it can actually, the bone can actually fracture because the tumor sort of eats away at the bone. So um, speaking from just an IR perspective, um, there are, are treatments that we can do to treat both. Um, so one we do is uh, we actually, we can do ablation for, for bone mets. So we can put needles into the bone and, and burn the tumor away. And then, um, and then secondly, we can fix the fracture by essentially inflating bo uh, balloons to kind of restore the height of the bone and then fill the cavity with um, uh, cement. Uh, most, most of these fractures occur in the spine. So this is called, you know, spinal ablation uh, with uh, what we call kyphoplasty. Thank you, Oz. We're almost out of time, but let's do one more just because we have, we're having so much fun here. So let's see this one. Are there um, any new therapies for neuroendocrine tumor patients that lack somatostatin receptors? I think, Jen, you gave us a great talk about all the potential things that are on the way here and the clinical trials that are going on. But is there anything on your end that you can think of to answer a question? It's a little bit of a general question, but. Yeah, I think, um, you know, there is um, a lot of work that's being done to look at targeted therapies. Um, for instance, cabozantinib is a uh, an agent, a tyrosine kinase inhibitor that's being investigated. But you know, essentially all of the systemic therapies that we currently use, whether it be everolimus or chemotherapy are things that we would, you know, use instead of a somatostatin analog or a PRT and, you know, any trial that doesn't require presence of somatostatin receptors potentially um, could be considered in, in a patient whose disease is not, not somatostatin receptor expressing. And that uh, certainly 
comes also uh, to a point that uh, most of us are also doing research and obviously trying to figure out how we can, uh, you know, improve the treatments of uh, those tumors. They do have some metastatin receptors, but also of those that don't, uh, obviously. So I think that's pretty much it. Um, I'd like to thank all of you for uh, an amazing day. I think uh, uh, you really Eve get, uh, each gave a fantastic lecture. I've followed all of you. I think uh, I think it's, it was really phenomenal. I hope that our patients um, enjoyed it as much as I did. Um, thank you, obviously, to the Neuroendocrine Tumor Research Foundation for um, organizing this. This, I think, is the fifth year that I'm co-chairing this. So uh, it's it's been really a pleasure to work with uh, NetRF, and it's been a pleasure to work with all of you. So I hope to see you back next year, um, and hopefully I'll see you before that, though. So thank you so much to all of you. Have a great weekend, and I think uh, we will switch over if you want to go back to the NetRF website for some final uh, comments. And uh, I'll see you next year. Thank you.